Before we begin this session, don't forget to take advantage of the free resources available at practicingtheway.org. I love driving through wine country and seeing row after row of green, each vine rooting itself in the earth and reaching up to the sun to grow. I'm struck by how essential the trellis is to the vine. You never see a vine growing wild on the ground. It always has a support structure underneath it. And I can't help but think of Jesus' teaching. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. The soul of a disciple of Jesus is like a branch in a vine. And we too need a trellis in order to grow. In the Christian tradition, this is called a rule of life. Over the last six sessions, we've laid out a vision of apprenticeship to Jesus. Now we're ready to shift gears and make a plan to turn that vision into a reality. Transformation is possible, but it's not inevitable. It won't just happen. We need a plan. Pete Scazzaro of Emotionally Healthy Discipleship has said, nurturing a growing spirituality with depth in our present day culture will require a thoughtful, conscious, intentional plan for our spiritual lives. We all have a plan for the things we most value. Most of us have a plan for our money or what we call a budget. We have a plan for our time or what we call a schedule. Many of us have a plan for our career or summer vacation or our diet or exercise routine, but not for our apprenticeship to Jesus. I've been around soccer moms with more of a plan for their kids' pathway to professional sports than for their discipleship to Jesus. The question is, how do we make a plan to be spiritually formed? Let me introduce you to the answer the first followers of Jesus came up with. They called it a rule of life. A rule of life is a schedule and a set of practices and relational rhythms that create space for us to be with Jesus, become like Him, and do as He did. It's an intentional plan to slow down and simplify our life around being spiritually formed by Jesus. Rule of life is ancient language, so it can sound strange or even off-putting to our modern ears. But notice, it's rule of life, singular, not rules for life, plural. The original Latin word used by our spiritual ancestors was regula, where we get English words like regular and regulation, as well as rule and ruler, because it literally means a straight piece of wood. Some scholars believe it was the word used in the ancient Mediterranean for a trellis in a vineyard. In John 15, Jesus gave his most famous teaching on spiritual formation. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Early Christian teachers picked up on Jesus' metaphor and followed it to its logical conclusion. For a vine to bear much fruit, what does it need? A trellis, a support structure, to lift it up off the ground, guide it in the desired direction, and guard it from damage, disease, and dangerous predators. In the same way, 
to abide in the vine and bear much fruit. Apprentices of Jesus need a trellis, a support structure to guard and guide their lives into transformation. A rule of life is exactly that, a trellis. It's a way to schedule into our daily life practices and relational rhythms that align our time and our habits to our deepest desires to be with Jesus and become like him. The motivation behind a rule isn't duty, it's desire. Think of the way an athlete disciplines themselves with daily drills or a musician with daily practice. It's all in service of a deeper desire. They know we have to connect our desires to daily disciplines if we want to see them become a reality. For apprentices of Jesus, a rule of life is made up of daily practices, like beginning your day in prayer and the reading of scripture, weekly practices, like keeping Sabbath and gathering with community, and monthly practices, like serving the poor and preaching the gospel. It's all the practices we intentionally, repeatedly do to offer our lives up to God for transformation. Put another way, a rule of life is an intentional plan for our spiritual formation. And in the chaos of modern life, with all its hurry and digital distraction and cross pressures, we need a rule more than ever before. It's an ancient idea whose time has come again. You may love this concept of a rule of life, or you may hate it, especially if you're a more spontaneous and fun-loving personality, or if you come out of a legalistic religious background and are wary of any talk of rules. But here's the thing, you already have a rule of life, whether it's written or unwritten, conscious or subconscious, wise or foolish, based on long-term vision or short-term instant gratification, moving you toward your desired destination or sabotaging your best intentions. Even if you have never heard the phrase rule of life until three minutes ago, you have one. We all do. We have a way in which we live, a morning routine, a typical workday, a network of relationships, a budget, things we spend our time on, and more. The question is not, do you have a rule of life? It's, do you know what your rule of life is? And is it giving you the life you most deeply desire? Is it working for you or against you? Many of us feel far from God so much of the time, always in a hurry, stuck in our spiritual formation, still living and wounding from our past or dysfunctional patterns in our present. The problem is not that our rule of life isn't working. It's that it is. You and I are being formed, for better or worse, by the choice architecture of our lives, by all the habits and relationships and environments and decisions that fill our days, by our rule of life. I discovered I had a rule of life, an unconscious rule of life, while I was working on this book, The TechWise Family, and I, it dawned on me, writing this book about technology and family life, that I had an absolutely uh, ironclad practice every single day of walking downstairs when I got up in the morning, and the first thing I did was look at my phone. That's what you do in the morning, right? Look at your phone. And, you know, I'd be making tea, but I, even before the tea was finished, um, I'd let the glowing rectangle tell me whatever I needed to pay attention to. All the urgencies, all the outrages, all the demands, all the opportunities. And somehow I had the presence of mind one morning to think this cannot possibly be the best way to start my day uh, because it would just instantly adrenalate me, you know? So I thought, well, what can I do instead that would be kind of a sufficient counter discipline to this habit of picking up my phone every day? And I thought, you know what I ought to do is go outside. So I decided that every day uh, after making my tea, there's one habit I'm not gonna give up, which is tea first, but I'd take my tea outside and just walk out the front door, stand outside just for a few moments um, and, and just experience whatever the day had for me before I turned to the glowing rectangle. And the first two weeks that I was trying this, every day 
was a ridiculous spiritual battle. Like this is not a complicated thing to do. And yet every morning it was like this phone, almost, I could almost sense like a voice calling to me from the little phone. Don't you need to check me? Don't you want to try me? And I'd have to resist and say, no, get behind me. I'm not, I'm going outside first. Two weeks in, uh, I heard the voice uh, just like the days before, but something absolutely flipped. And instead of uh, feeling temptation and allure, all I felt was revulsion and repulsion. Like, why would I invest in you this most beautiful first moment of my day rather than go out and be a creature in God's creation? And ever since I've, I've done this, um, it uh, is one of the most spiritually transformative things I've done with my life, probably in the last 10 years, maybe embarrassingly. Uh, just step outdoors, whatever the weather is, wherever I am in the world. Sometimes I walk down flights and flights of stairs if I'm staying in a hotel or something, and just spend a moment um, being who I really am, which is a very small part of a very large world, rather than what I am on the screen, which is a very large part of a very small world. And it's been a gift um, to choose to be who I really am. And that's what our disciplines are for. That's what the real rule is for, is to choose to be who I know I am and want to be. And now we're finally ready to craft a rule of life. Everything we do is invitational. We make recommendations, you make the decisions. But if you're ready to take the next step in your apprenticeship to Jesus and make an intentional plan for your spiritual formation, let me offer you a few tips. One, start small. It's easy to get overexcited and overreach, but this is a strategy doomed to fail. When it comes to the spiritual life, as a general rule, start where you are, not where you should be. We must find God inside the contours of our ordinary life, not the life we used to have or plan to have or wish we had, but the life we actually have. So start wherever you are. For most of us, that means start small, with what psychologists call tiny habits, small, easy, joyful practices for life with God. Yes, a full hour every morning for prayer before you touch your phone is ideal. But if that's too big of a leap, start with 15 minutes or 10 minutes or two minutes. Start there. Secondly, think subtraction, not addition. Take out more than you put in. Less is more. It's tempting to write your rule as a list of things to do, and that's not all bad. But for most of us, it's just as important, if not more so, to make a list of what we're not going to do. A rule of life is not about doing more, but doing less. It's about ruthlessly eliminating hurry from your life. Third, take a balanced approach. You can plot the practices of Jesus along four axis points, disciplines you do alone and those you do in community and disciplines of doing, like worship or feasting or service, and of not doing, like solitude, silence, or fasting. Naturally, you're going to be drawn to some practices and shy away from others. That's totally normal. Just make sure you design a rule that covers the whole range of your formation, not just your personality preferences. That said, take into account your personality and season of life. Work with your personality, not against it. If you're more introverted and intellectual, carve out plenty of time to read and reflect. If you're more extroverted and action-oriented, prioritize doing meaningful things with other people. Yes, we need a balanced approach, but some of us need way more of certain practices than others. Design a rule that is congruent with your personality and season of life. Just as our budget and schedule change through the various seasons of our life, our rule must as well. Fifth, there is no formation without repetition. Formation is slow and at times monotonous work. In the moment, it often doesn't feel like it's doing anything to us at all. It is, it's just slow. But over time, the practices have a cumulative effect upon our spiritual formation. It's like Mr. Miyagi and the Karate Kid. In the moment, we just feel like we're waxing Mr. Miyagi's car or pounding nails into the dojo edition. 
but actually we're becoming a karate master. In the moment, we just feel like we're beginning our day in prayer or practicing Sabbath or going to church, but actually we're becoming like our master, Jesus. We just have to stay with the process and find joy in our ordinary life with God. Finally, do this in community. It's easy to think of crafting a rule of life as something I do. I write my rule. That's not all bad. To repeat, you already have a rule, so anything that brings more intentionality to your apprenticeship to Jesus is powerful. But historically, a rule of life was for a community. It was designed to hold a community together around shared rhythms of spiritual formation. And following a rule in community can change everything. There is something about starting the Sabbath, not just by yourself, but with a meal in community, makes the entire practice so much more fun. There is something about fasting on Fridays and knowing that you're doing it with your community. All of you are pooling the money you would have spent on food together to give to your local food bank. It's just better in community. So as you make a rough draft this coming week of your first rule of life, if at all possible, do it in community. You could do it with one friend or your small group or table community or women's Bible study or even with your entire church. This will be a lot messier and take a lot longer to figure out, but that's okay. It will be worth it. In your guide is an example rule of life from Practicing the Way that I live by with our community, along with a few other samples from different people and different stages of life. But this does not need to feel overwhelming. Again, start small. Your rule may start as two or three simple practices, beginning your day by reading a psalm, getting coffee with a close friend once a week, and spending a few hours each Sunday in Sabbath rest. That's a beautiful start. You can always add practices in over time. Just take the next step. Speaking of doing this all in community, let's take a few minutes to process this concept of a rule of life and dream together about what this could look like. Circle up in your groups and have a conversation around the following questions. The first, what makes up your current rule of life? As John Mark shared, we already have a rule of life. What practices and relationship are currently the most central to your life and discipleship to Jesus? Second, as you think about designing a rule of life, how would you describe the spiritual needs of your personality in current season of life? Third, what practices do you want to include in your rule of life? And fourth, who would be important to incorporate in the process of building your rule of life? We now come to the exercise this entire course has been building to, crafting a rule of life. When I was in my 20s, I was working in the corporate world in Japan as what they call a 7-Eleven man, which meant that my workday went from 7 in the morning until 11 at night. My life felt crazy back then. When I became a pastor in Vancouver, Canada, I found myself working almost the same hours. I felt like I was constantly treading water. Establishing a rule of life, having a rhythm of life that supports my relationship with Jesus has felt like a literal lifeline. It's been the most life-giving and transformative practice of my life. Ideally, your rule of life will feel like a gift, not an obligation, a get-to, not a have-to. If, after crafting your rule, your life feels heavier. You likely have a self-constructed routine, not a Holy Spirit-inspired rhythm. 
If your rule is spirit-inspired, your life will feel supported, lighter, and freer. Remember, as is true of the Sabbath, the rule is made for you, not you for the rule. In your guide, please turn to session seven and consider the template. Now, there's no one right way to do this. There's no one-size-fits-all approach to spiritual formation. Feel free to be creative. Make sure your rule fits the unique person you are. But you may find it helpful to think about practices and relational rhythms in three categories, daily, weekly, and monthly or seasonally. First, let's look at daily. What do you want to do and not do on a daily basis? For example, you might want to begin your day in silent prayer and by reading scripture. And you might not want to begin your day by looking at the news feeds or social media posts on your phone. Second, weekly. What do you want to do on a weekly basis? For example, you might want to honor the Sabbath, worship at church, and share a meal with your community. Third, monthly or seasonally. What rhythms do you want to work into your life regularly? For instance, you might want to incorporate the practice of a retreat or a day in solitude, or serving those living in poverty, or sharing hospitality with your neighbors. In your guide, you will find nine practices that we offer training for through Practicing the Way. We've introduced a number of them in this course. Some of these include beginning your day with God as you practice solitude, prayer, and scripture, a weekly Sabbath, a gift in our era we cannot afford to refuse. And next week, we'll end by calling you to a regular touch point with community. These practices that you're already doing are the beginning of a rule of life. Our hope is that you will build on this foundation and continue to refine it over time. If you're unable to incorporate all these practices, seek to live your rule as you can, not as you can't. As you write your rule of life, tap into your deepest desires, what you most want in your life with God and the kind of person you long to become. Let your God-given desires fuel your actions. Let your vision of life to be with Jesus and to become like Jesus inspire you to practice the way. To support you in this exercise, we have included several sample rules of life in the course guide from different people in different stages of life. May God give you wisdom, creativity, joy, and peace as you craft your rule of life. Here's what we covered in this session. Transformation is possible, but it's not inevitable. We need an intentional plan for our spiritual formation, what the early Christians called a rule of life. A rule of life is a schedule and a set of practices and relational rhythms that create space for us to be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do as he did. When crafting a rule for the first time, it's important to start small and begin with subtraction, not addition. This coming week, our exercise is to design a rule of life. The novelist Annie Dillard famously said, how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. What we do with this hour and that one is what we are doing. A schedule defends from chaos and whim. It is a peace and a haven set into the wreck of time. It is a lifeboat on which you find yourself decades later still living. A rule of life is a way to live with greater intentionality to line up our schedule with the deepest desires of our heart to be with and become like Jesus. But it must be said, following Jesus is not a formula, it is a friendship. A rule of life is not a regimen of spiritual disciplines by which we habit stack our way to spiritual maturity. A rule of life is just a way to put friendship with Jesus at the center of our life, not off to the side. And through the practices that make up our rule, we offer up our whole life, the good, the bad, and even the ugly, 
all that we are up to God in love. Again, transformation is God's work, not ours. We are not in control of our spiritual formation. God does it His way at His pace. Living by a rule is just a way to say daily, God, here I am. Heal me, free me, transform me. I love you. Love me into a person of love.